You're listening to the Platform Launchers podcast. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us this week, as always, because we love talking about building and growing and monetizing your online platform. We like to take your passion, turn it into a platform, and help you turn that into a paycheck. And once in a while, we have the privilege to bring a guest expert onto our podcast and onto our YouTube channel to share some of their unique insights and perspectives. And this week, we are privileged to have a return guest with us. We have Honoré Corder. Honoré is a very prolific author. She's also a good friend. And at this point now, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. I believe she sold about 4.5 million copies of her books, which tells me that she might have something to say about writing books and about marketing books and about selling books. And I think that we would do well to listen to some of the things that she has in mind, because it's not too often that you get to talk to somebody that has helped put that much literature out into the market. And so I'm really grateful to have Honoré Corder with us today. Honoré, welcome to the Platform Launchers podcast. I'm delighted to be back with you, John. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Well, we're glad to have you here. And I'm just going to show for our YouTube audience two covers. I want you to see two book covers. These are the two most recent books that Honoré has released. She recently released Write Your First Nonfiction Book. And so we're going to be asking her a few questions about that. And a few months ago, she also released this book right here, The Best Selling Book Formula. And we're going to get into that de those details as well. But Honoré, when you started this year, did you have in the back of your mind a kind of a fixed goal of this year I'm going to release this many books or how do you plan out a year? Do you have yearly goals, weekly goals? How does that look for you? Um, I have a production schedule for my books and I started penciling them out in October. So my January book, I started in October and I sent the email to my assistant and I said, FYI, these are the books I'm writing and releasing next year on this schedule. And she said, you crazy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it. And that's the short answer. Yes, I, I have a schedule. I work from a schedule and it is about 18 months in advance. That's kind of fun because I think for many people, they look at just the goals they have for their life and they say, sometime in my life, I would love to write a book. And you're planning out your year and you're saying, not only can you make that a life goal, you can make that a one or two month goal. If you uh, think it through, plan it out and, uh, and actually, you know, do the work to help make it happen. Correct. So yes. this, this book here, write your first nonfiction book is a very interesting and accessible book. You have a variety of personal stories in it. You brought other authors in to tell some of their stories. What inspired you to put this book together? That was Kent Sanders. You might have mm -hmm. heard of him. I have heard of him. <laughs> yes. I have a, a, a daily email that I send out that is a two or three minute read. And I that book was originally a, an email, the contents of an email, just saying, if you don't know what to put in which chapter here's a process that you can apply to your first book just to get you out of being stuck and into some momentum right that that it's not a it's not the bible because there's only one of those but it is a, a process that you can apply and then you can move the pieces around so chapter one is about this but chapter one if it makes sense could be chapter five you could do some moving around but a lot of people overthink what they write about and where in their books. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just create a, a resource that would allow people to get out of their um, inertia and into action and, and start to get their, their book written. I also wanted it to be a size that was manageable because when I'm handed a 300 page book, I'm super excited about it because I'm the book lady. 
<laughs> but not everyone feels like, oh, great. Now I have to read a book about writing a book and it's very long and it feels like it's complex and there's a lot of information and I'm overwhelmed. So what's on Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to go do that. And I'm already starting to see people who are writing their books because they feel empowered and inspired to do it, that there's no wrong way to do it. There's no right way to do it. Just doing it is is the, the order of the day. See English, 7.30 at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, you used a word there that I thought was kind of interesting because it came up in a meeting that I had earlier today as well. I had a meeting with someone earlier today and he said, you know, there's some things that I'm working on, but I keep overthinking everything. And he says, my wife tells me I overthink everything. And now I'm hearing you use that word. And, you know, in his context, he was saying overthinking prevents me from getting certain things done. And right. you're using that word to apply to authoring a book. And you're saying a lot of times people just overthink this when it's actually not that complicated. It is not that complicated. And also overthinking it can cause you to get so incredibly stuck that you never take action. And it mm. is not that you don't want to be thoughtful when you're writing your book, because being thoughtful is going to serve you in the long run, but trusting your gut and trusting your intuition and trusting that you know what you're talking about, because we're all mm -hmm. writing nonfiction in an, in an atmosphere like this, and you already know what to say. It's already up there. If someone asked you a question about what you were writing, you wouldn't overthink your answer. You would just answer it. Mm -hmm. I think about writing as though I'm having a conversation. I'm just doing it with my fingers. Well, do you think some people overthink what they're putting in a book in the sense that they they say, all right, you know, if I put something in a book that carries a certain amount of weight and a certain amount of authority. And because we overweigh some of these things, we also overthink it. Do you think that's part of the process or part of the holdup, I should say, for some people? I think it can be. I think there are all sorts of things that get people um, blocked in, in what they're writing mm -hmm. and how much they should write it. Like how many, I, the questions I get all the time, how many words, how many words are in it? How many chapters are in it? How much, how much, how many, how often, right? All the things. And so I think it, it, if you start to go down that rabbit hole, my solution to that is perhaps the questions aren't as good as they could be. Right. So if somebody says to you, if they, if they come up to you and they're, they're saying, all right, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how long the book should be. And it's kind of an interesting thing to say that when you haven't yet written the book, right? Yeah. So people are thinking about how long the book should be when they haven't written the first chapter. How, how do you help them work through an answer to a question like that in this book? Because that's one of the subjects you address in here. Yes. So that is a great question. I'm not sure what I said in the book. <laughs> because I'm fully into the next book, but I'll give you my answer right now, which is I want you to think about the contents of your book as answering the questions that the book is answering. You say what you need to say, nothing more, nothing less. There is no too short and there is no too long. I don't like books that are gratuitously long. The books that someone says, oh, it has to be 300 pages or it has to be 80,000 words. And so, so they are legitimately making up things like, oh, let me put in more about this or let me say what I said before, only a different way from a different angle. It, if it doesn't add value to the reader, if it doesn't get them into action, cause them to have a distinction, help them to do something better, solve their problem, then you can probably leave it out. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think about some of the book contracts that are that are given, when I was my um, one of my books being traditionally published, the contract itself said it has to be this long. Right. So, right. you know, the the publishers, they some of them have this perspective that if the book isn't at least like 225 pages, that seems to be like the going page count that somehow it can't be a, a, a book. And yet I look at your book sales and I look at the content that you produce and it's very obvious that what you're trying to do is be helpful, not just be verbose, right? You're not just trying to take right. up people's time unnecessarily. You're trying to be helpful. I, and I'm assuming that's, is that how you would summarize your philosophy of what you're putting together? 
yes, I want people to feel empowered and in inspired and get into action as soon as possible. I want to help them to avoid pain and gain pleasure. Mm -hmm. No pain and suffering, prosperity and happiness. Okay. <laughs> so, so I want to give everything that I need to give, but nothing more, nothing less. And so the size book that you're holding, write your first nonfiction book is 21,000 words. The best-selling book formula is 15,000 words. Okay. There's a little bit of math and science to the size and the page numbers. And, and I can talk about that if you'd like, but um, I find that when I hand someone a short book, they will call me within a couple of days and say, I've already read your book, mm -hmm. which I have a lot of other books that are much longer. And I don't get that same turn mm -hmm. in terms of, I got your book. I read your book. You right. Gave me your book. I've read your book. I've taken action. I want to talk about this. I have questions. I'm now ready to write my book. How, how can you help me with that? And that's mm -hmm. the goal is to get people into that conversation, to get them into action, because being an author is awesome. <laughs> so I want to get people from, I want to be an author to they're an author as soon as possible. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, I, as you're doing that, as you're trying to help demystify that for many people, I, I'm guessing that many of the questions you get are very tactical, but it, it also sounds like what you're trying to help people do is wrestle with their mindset where it, it's, it's not even so much, you know, trying to figure out uh, the specifics of do this or do that. It's, it's just, you know, put your objections aside, put all the parameters that you thought you had to have on this aside and actually just do something that's helpful. That's right. Put yourself in, in the position of being your younger self or your mm -hmm. ideal client or customer and tell them what they need to know answer their questions, help them to overcome their mental blocks, mm -hmm. their psychological um, or external blocks. I remember I published my first book and my, one of my best friend's husband said, who is on a way to write a book? And I said, he's never flying on my G5, that guy. He's going to fly commercial. You don't believe in me? You don't get to fly on the jet. I don't have a jet yet, but I'm still, you know, 20 years later, <laughs> going, he's flying commercial and commercial is not that fun to fly. For the record, right? <laughs> no, it is not that fun to fly, uh, and and so uh, it 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 is kind of interesting and also kind of motivating when you think about the people that doubt you at an earlier season and how for some people they would internalize that and just feel emotionally crushed. And it sounds like for you in your context, you said, you know what, um, I'm just going to use that as an extra dose of motivation. That's going to be an extra source of what kind of just fuels me as uh, I attempt to do the different things that I feel called to do. And I like yes. that mindset. Yes. Yes. I want, I want everyone to feel like they can do anything and that anything is possible that they turn the word impossible into I'm possible. Right. And they start to take action and they, they think, well, maybe, I don't know if I can do it and, but I'm still going to do it anyway and prove to myself that I can do it even while I'm doubting that I can do it and not listen to anyone who is telling you that you can't do it. Mm -hmm. they don't do you think know. somebody, do you think somebody could sit down and uh, this is going to be a, this is kind of a strange question, but, okay. uh, but do you think someone could sit down and uh, if they had just a week that was blocked off, do you think from start to finish, they could write a book in a week? Yes. It, it, so there, I'm going to asterisk C fine print below, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the lawyer answer, which right. is the, um, if you know what you're talking about and you have done some pre-work and you don't run out of words, right? because I can write for a certain amount of time. And then even though I know that there's more to write and I know what it is that I'm going to write, my brain says, no, we're done. <laughs> no more words today. Go have a cookie. So if, if some people can write 10,000 words in a day, I have friends who write prolifically, much more prolifically than I do. And they will write all day. They'll say, I write from eight in the morning until two in the afternoon. And they'll write three, four, 5,000 words. I have never been able to do that. After I get to 1,000, 1,500, maybe 2,000 words, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'm out. So yes, do I think it's possible? Yes, I think anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Who am I to say that it's not possible? Well, it's also interesting too, you know, in this context that we live in uh, with Kindle books, digital books, eBooks, all that sort of thing, a book doesn't have to be the same length that it once had to be. I mean, you could, some of my, my early books that I released, I only released them on Kindle. And I look back at the page count and it says 
yeah, that book's only 35 pages. And people look at it and they're like, that's a, that's a book. I'm like, well, it was 35 pages and it shows up as a book. Traditionally, they might not quite consider that a book, but in the world of digital publishing and all the options that we have with that, right. you know, and I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't want to wait around for someone to give me permission to, to, to write a book at a, any certain length. I just wanted to get the content out there. And I, right. I look at that. I had one day that, that very book that I, I mentioned, that's 35 pages. I had, I had a day where in one day that book sold 6,000 copies. Now, uh -huh. most, most of them, I shouldn't say sold. It got in 6,000 hands. A lot of them were freebies, but I just remember thinking on that day, I was like, all right, 6,000 people now have a copy of this book. And one day it ended up getting picked up and promoted somewhere. And if I was waiting for somebody to tell me, no, it has to be this long or it has to fit this parameter, right. I never would have experienced that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And the only thing that I would say to that, and I have three little mini eBooks mm -hmm. on Amazon that are 99 cents. I wrote each of them in an afternoon. I designed the book covers in word, all the things that today make me twitch a little <laughs> for sure. But they were published at a time when I had no idea. I didn't know what I didn't know, but I kind of got into the momentum of writing. Mm -hmm. Some people really like the content of the books, even though like you said, they're 35 pages or 10 pages or whatever. Um, right. There were no rules around it. Now, when I'm talking to someone about their book, I do think you can write a book in a week and you can put out books prolifically, but think about your book as an asset that you want to sell for 10 years. When it comes to quality and production, you want a great cover. You want an editorial process, right? There are things that, that totally. are going to help your book to be a work workhorse for many, many years to come and be a, an integral part of your platform. It could actually be the foundation of your platform. Yeah, it really could. And I, I like the fact that you just described it as an asset, you know, thinking of it as an asset that is kind of part of your, you know, just your mix of assets. It, it's interesting. Um, do you ever hear the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? Of course. So that's that's a pretty well known book, and I looked recently, and it was still in the Amazon top twenty. Yep. He wrote that book in the mid nineties. Yep. And it has I don't think it's ever dropped out of the top twenty since he wrote it, because people use it all the time. He's got different versions of it. So here he he did work in the mid nineties that if he didn't want to, he doesn't have to work another day in his life. Yeah. That work that he did one time thirty years ago is something he could just continue to live off of. And you're saying here, you know, if you're, as you're describing this as an asset, you know, may, maybe we're not going to, you know, see book sales like Gary Chapman, but at the same time, it could be part of an overall mix of different things that we put in that asset bucket. And uh, it ends up becoming something that over time ends up, you know, being a, a huge benefit to us and helps fund our overall platform. Absolutely. And I would bet if we applied the best selling book formula to that, it would meet the standards. Well, you so you mentioned the best-selling book formula and that you released this book several months ago, although today as we're recording this interview, the audio book of the best-selling book formula just came out earlier today. So congratulations on that. Thank you. By the way, do you think everybody should, if they can, that they should have an audio book of their, uh, of their written book? 100%. And here's why. Audio is the fastest growing segment of publishing. It's very easy for people to listen to a book if they don't have time to sit down and read. When mm -hmm. you're sitting down and reading a book, and by the way, thank you. If you if you ever have read my book or John's book or anyone's book, the author appreciates that because it's a, it's a, a nice uh, gift that you give the author your most precious resources, your time to sit and read. Mm -hmm. It is the only thing you can do when you're reading. You right? If you're focusing, you're not doing anything else. If you're listening to a book, you can be driving, exercising, cleaning, walking your dog. There's so many ways you can repurpose it. And that's why it's so easy for um, people to buy audiobooks and why it's so important um, to have that as an option for a long time. And I'll speak to your, your ebook option and my ebook option. There was a period of time in my publishing journey where I only wanted to have eBooks because I didn't want to carry around books. I was wanting yeah. to have the books with me. And so I didn't publish audio books. I didn't publish physical books. And then I realized that I'm not my customer. I'm not my reader. Mm. I'm the reader of other people's books. And how do I want them? I want them to be in digital format. 
But when you're thinking about whether you should have an audiobook, you want to think about how your reader would best um, metabolize your content. And I will say that if you have your book in audiobook form and it's good, then people will go and buy the physical copy of the book or they'll buy the digital copy of the book because they want to be able to read it in a different way. Because seeing it is a different type of reading and holding a book physically is a different type of reading. Right. Yeah, very true. And the the books that you've been releasing here, they really seem to build on each other. You you have this idea of the best selling book formula, and I know you're being very strategic. This is no accident. You planned this out last year, but yeah, and you have write your your first nonfiction book. So you're basically giving people a library here that if they choose to utilize what you've put together, you're you're saying here is a formula you can use that will help you create books and market books and sell books. Correct. I, I had to figure it all out on my own. I, there weren't a lot of people who had gone before me who had um, self-published. And so all of my books are self-published except for the foreign translations of any of my books are all traditional published, right? They're all done by publishers. Um, and also this audio book was done by Podium Publishing and that is considered a traditional publisher. So until today, I was not a real boy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Right now, I now I'm I'm uh, not Geppetto anymore, right? I'm I'm yeah, a right. little boy. <laughs> or not, what, who was Pinocchio? That? You think Pinocchio? Pinocchio, yes, yeah. yes. Now I'm a real boy, um, which is very exciting. But I had to figure it out because there was a lot of when I first started a lot of stigma around being a self-published author, and people would say, "Well, who published you?" And I would say, "That would be me." And, you know, I kind of, the, I get the last laugh a little bit because I have had a lot of friends um, come around to indie publishing. I have, I've worked with a lot of famous people who have entrusted me to help them publish their books because they went through traditional publishing and were incredibly disappointed with the results of it and realized that regardless of who publishes it, the onus is on the author to sell those books and figure it out. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say that the uh, one of the things that people need to prepare themselves for. I mean, it's it's wonderful to have the machine of a traditional publisher and all the connections and you know the the editing options and everything else that they already have in place. They've already got a system. They've already got you know all that worked out. It's also nice to receive an advance even before you do the work that you've done. All that's great stuff. There is merit to that. There is benefit to that. However. Sure. The, the primary complaint that most people will tell you when they get traditionally published is they thought that they were going to be marketed much more thoroughly than they really were. And it, it's in your book, the best selling book formula, you're trying to help people understand like how to own that marketing yourself, right? Correct. Correct. There are four keys to the best selling book formula. There are four things you can look for when you're looking at any book, whether it's Think and Grow Rich or the Five Love Languages or the Best Selling Book Formula, right? Any book that's going to do well over time, that's going to sell for a decade. There are four things that all the books have in common. They are easy to read, which means they are readable at the seventh grade level or below. So kudos to you if you can use a $25 word, but if someone doesn't understand it, it is a bumpy ride, right? And too many of those will cause someone to put your book down and go somewhere else, right? It needs to be easy to remember, even if they can't remember something exactly like the morning miracle. So some of you have heard of the, mir the miracle morning. I have a lot of people who say, oh, I love that book series, right? It's the, the morning miracle. And I'm like, yes, it is absolutely. Because they're remembering, <laughs> <laughs> they're remembering it close enough, close enough for government work, right? So right. we just have to get close enough so that if they search for it, they can find it, right? So easy to read easy to remember, easy to do. So you need to have a process in your book that someone can duplicate something that you've done without talking to you that they can put into practice, right? So something that they can do or execute and sharing, sharing your results with them in writing so that without ever talking to you, without having any more conversation with you, they can take what you're sharing with them and put it to practice and get a result. And then finally, the last piece is easy to share. 
Mm. And so all of those books, so when we look at the five love languages, is it easy to read? Probably if we did an analysis of it, it would probably come in at the seventh or eighth grade level, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to remember. We can remember there are five love languages and we, and I haven't read the book in probably 20 years, but I remember that there are uh, physical touch, mm -hmm. quality time, acts of service, um, presence, mm -hmm. There's something else, but close enough, words of affirmation, words of affirmation. Yes. Yes. Will you validate my parking? No, but I will tell you that you're a very handsome man. And <laughs> <laughs> you will do fine. Right. So all of those things come right to mind when you are putting the, the good content in that someone can, can remember. And then finally, it's easy to share. It's so compelling that, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that my husband was a quality time person. And I'm an acts of service person and I'm just making this up. But once you realize that it's like, oh, well, we need to spend quality time together. And so that he feels loved and cared for. And I want him to do the laundry so that I feel loved and cared for. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous, right? Make me some brisket. That's true. That's what, that's what Byron's love language is, right? Providing brisket for other people. Providing brisket for me and all of my friends. Yes. <laughs> so when you think about it from that perspective, when you look at any book, when you read any book now, you will notice that you can apply these keys and the more that they are embraced in that content and accidentally, because I made up the best-selling book formula, I went and looked for what helped books to sell and what differentiated them from all the other books. And I used to say, Hal Elrod, my co-creator of the Miracle Morning book series, I used to say he was a unicorn. Like, oh, he just wrote this book. He self-published it. It wasn't so great. The cover wasn't so great. It wasn't really edited all that well, but he was, he just had a blessing, right? Jesus just kind of reached down and said, you, you get to be a best-selling author, right? <laughs> and I would look at these other books. And then I, I started to question my, assum my assumption. I started to, to challenge what I had assumed was true. And I went looking for what were the commonalities, what were the common factors of, um, of books that did well over time? Because if you're gonna go to the trouble of writing a book, putting it out into the world, wouldn't it be great if it was just, you woke up one day and it had sold 6,000 copies like with John, right? Wouldn't it be great if, if it was doing its job, which whatever the job is, the, the job of some of my books is to bring people into my ecosystem so that they mm -hmm. can buy more things, right? So you're building a platform with different things. Your, your book is, is an opportunity for people to discover you and then say, oh gosh, well, what else does he have? Does he have courses? Does he have a, a membership group? Can I go hang out with them, right? Does he have other books? Like what else is available? And the book is the entry point. So you want it to really do its job and you want it to do its job well as an asset. You want it to be working hard for you for a long time. Yeah. And it's all fired up. I got all fired up, John. I could tell you're, you're like <laughs> that. Just, you just rattled that off that, but it, I, and I agree with you completely hundred percent. It, it also uh, establishes, you know, if someone's listening to us right now and they're just trying to think like, should I write a book? One of the things that a book will help do is establish your authority on whatever subject you feel led to teach about, you know, if you're the person that that took the time to actually write a book on it, whether people even read the book that you wrote, just the fact that you took the time to actually put that content together does set you apart from at least some other voices on a particular subject. You're the one that took the risk. And, and Honoré, I mean, at this point now, I, how many books, do you have a guess how many books you've written? Would you take so a stab at 60, it? I think 61. 61 books. Yeah. So 20 years ago, was that something that, that you could have really envisioned, you know, will no. I be the author of 61 books? No, no, no. I keep thinking any day I'm going to wake up from this really good dream I'm having and they're going to go, okay, <laughs> more bricklaying today. <laughs> they're like, yep. It's yeah. Back the books all go away. Right. Back to uh, work. Yes. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I, I look at that and I think, that is not as impossible as some people like to tell themselves it is. You didn't write 61 books in a day, but no. you wrote one book, one chapter at a time. And then when you finished one, you had the idea for the next one and you said, all right, now it's time for the next one. And the more you write them, I mean, you could answer this for, you know, how you would think is appropriate to answer it. But yeah. I imagine that at this point now, writing a book is not something that intimidates you. 
You know, it's, it, I don't know that you'd ever call it easy, but you look at it and you say, like, I absolutely can get this done and I can get it done in a reasonable amount of time. 100%. I know exactly how long it's going to take me to write a book. I have my production schedule out. I have my editor, my editorial team booked out for all the books in the future that are on the list. And I sat with someone and she said, I want you to give me five book ideas because she wants me to try to get an agent and get a traditional deal. So I was like, okay, why not? Why would I not try to sell a book? Okay, this will be fun, right? Because I'll just write it anyway. If they reject it, I'll just Right Publish anyway. it yourself. Yeah. And she said, come up with five ideas. And the next morning I emailed her with seven ideas. <laughs> Overachiever. <laughs> well, because it's like, once you ask the question, if I was going to write about something, what would I write about? Mm -hmm. What would be the thing that I would write about? And I was going to mm -hmm. say, I was at a, a business lunch the other day and the guy said, you know, who is the person that should write a book? And I said, the person who should write a book is the person for whom they have competition. If there is anyone else who says that they do exactly what you do, the way to differentiate yourself from them is to hand out a business, a business card in the form of a book. And I don't really like that term. Some people will say, oh, your, your, your book is your new business card. No, a business card is a business card, but I actually don't have business cards anymore. I either let someone take a screenshot of a QR code. So it populates my information on their phone or okay. I hand them a book or both, but I legitimately have no more business cards. Hmm. I like that. Very neat. So I'm assuming, and you know, while you're, while you're all energized here, right. While, while you've got this all like flowing in your brain, I'm assuming there's going to be somebody that's listening to us right now that is stuck on either an idea or their self doubt or something along those lines. And as we kind of wrap our conversation together, kind of tie these things together what words of wisdom would you have for that person that's feeling a bit stuck right now? How can they get unstuck and actually get something accomplished? Well, I would ask them to think about what they would want a book to do for them. So tune into WIIFM, what's in it for me? What would I like <laughs> the book to do for me? What would I like the book to do for my business? And then what would be the job of the book? What would the what would the book be doing while you're sleeping, while you're working, while you're doing something else? The 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 job of the book is to do something. What would the job of the book of the perfect book be? And then what would you want your reader to be able to accomplish after they've read your book? What would you want them to not do because they have the benefit of your wisdom? And then what would you want the right reader to do? Not that there's a wrong reader, but what would you want the right reader to do? So I'll use my book. You must write a book as an example of this. What's in it for what was in it for me was I wanted to establish myself as the expert for someone who wanted to write a book. I wanted to create a, a resource and I wanted uh, someone to understand that, that I was the person who knew what they were talking about. Um, the job of the book was to sell books and to bring people to the other things that I have, which I will not mention because we're in a hurry. Um, I wanted the, I wanted readers to be, to feel empowered to write and publish and monetize their book after reading my book. I wanted them to fail to write a book that did not fulfill their vision. I wanted them to publish a quality book that would work for them for a long time. So therefore they would fail to make amateur mistakes or make the mistakes that first or first, second and third time authors would make. And then finally the right reader would then say, what else you got, <laughs> right? And they would seek out some kind of additional work with me in whatever way would make sense. So if you can answer those five questions, then you can start to write your outline. And there's a whole bunch more I could say, but I'll let, I'll let you decide if I can say it. <laughs> oh, you could say, you could say you have free reign, but I just want to make sure that I'm adequately letting people know these resources that are fresh out right now. Write your first nonfiction book. If you don't have a copy of that, be sure to get a copy. Uh, very accessible, very readable by Honoré Quarter. And as she mentioned, the best-selling book formula was out a few months ago, but as of today, now the audio book is out as well. And um, and continue your thought there and and uh, and just just help someone get to that finish line if they're listening to us right now. Awesome, awesome. So then the next part is the outline. So people say, well, what goes in my outline? What do I put in my outline? And so my, my very first action step when I say, okay, I'm gonna write a book, I'm writing an outline, I write 
questions. I write the questions down. The first level questions, the level one questions are what are the things that people ask you? People ask me, how long should the book be, right? How many chapters are there? Do I have to include stories? Should I have a foreword? Do I need a co-author, right? Those are just common sense questions that everybody would know to ask. The level two questions are the questions that people, the smart people, the smarter people, the people who have done some research, they're gonna go, well, what about this? Or what about this? Like they have a little bit of insight, but they don't have inside, insight into your brain. So like, how do I launch a platform? Um, what are some ways to make money faster? Things like that. So I don't know that those are level two questions because I don't know what the level two questions are, John, but you would know what those are, right? The deeper questions. Mm -hmm. And then the level three questions are the expertise questions. They don't know what they don't know because they are not you. They don't have your level of experience. And I'll give a very quick level three uh, example. When my family moved to Nashville, we originally moved into a high rise and we were waiting to move into it because construction. So we called the lady who's the manager and we said, can we come? And she said, yes, you can come. You can move in. It's time. We said, great. But I didn't know to ask the level three question, which was, are the elevators working? So we get <laughs> our apartment was ready, but the elevators weren't ready. So we show up to get our keys. So it was myself, my husband, our daughter, and our puppy. So what do the puppies have to do 72 times a day? Yeah. They need to go out. So it's helpful if you have an elevator. Fourth floor, four floors up, two floors out of the garage. So we go to pick up our keys and she says, the elevator's not working. I thought she meant like today or this morning. She meant the elevator wasn't working. So for an entire <laughs> month, I was on the, the fitness program called taking my dog out to pee <laughs> <laughs> 11 million times. But I didn't know what I didn't know because I didn't have her level of knowledge. If I had known to ask, are the elevators, like the apartments ready? The, is the building ready? Are the elevators ready? Now I would know that because I have experience. So you wanna ask the, is the elevator working <laughs> question <laughs> to yourself because that's that's the, the golden ticket for people. That's the stuff that they don't even know that they don't know. And that's like, that's stuff you know right off the tip of your fingers. Oh, should I do this? Yes. Should I do that? No, and here are the three reasons why. So when you're working on your outline, you're going to put those questions in some kind of logical or linear order, and you're just going to take your reader on a journey. You're going to start them off by saying, you can do whatever I'm going to tell you you can do. Here are some people that have done it. And then here's this process. Here are the things that you need to know that I know that you don't know so that you can get from point A to point B as quickly and painlessly as possible while having a good time and enjoying the ride. I love it. Excellent counsel. Honoré, if, if someone's listening to us right now and they, they want to connect with you further, where is the best place for them to do so? They can go to honorequarter.com and I have a nifty eight-day write your book challenge that's free. It's an email sequence. Every single day, I'm just going to get them started on writing their book, sharing some of the stuff that I shared today and a little bit more. Excellent. And I can also tell you, she is a Honoré is a highly invested in her tribe kind of personality and leader. And uh, I've seen that directly. I even, you know, I didn't even mention this, but I'm going to mention this now. In uh, her book here, Write Your First Nonfiction Book, I had the privilege to write a portion of this book. It, and uh, so if you if you find, if you you find get a copy of the book, see if you could find me in it. She, Honoré, invited me to include the story of when I wrote my very first book, and uh, she shares it in her book there. So that was a real privilege to be able to, to join her in that project and see all the awesome things she's doing. Be sure to get the audio book of the best-selling book formula, or you could get the physical copy as well. And again, follow Honoré at honorécorder.com. Honoré, in just a moment, we're going to open up the floodgates to our members club for any questions that they have for you. But as we say goodbye to our, our audience via the podcast and via YouTube. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you for having me again, John. It's so great. It's like you do this for a living. You're so great at it. <laughs> it's like you do what you do for a living because we love the advice that you give. Thanks so much.